All right, everybody, what's up? Welcome back to the Negative BQ channel. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for September 5th, 2024. This is the second week in a row you're not seeing my face. I'm not sure that you'll see my face anymore going forward on these reviews. Because to let you know real quick, I've mentioned this once or twice in the past, but my actual setup here is in my dining room. You can imagine having a house with four kids and then obviously, obviously myself and my wife. There's probably not any extra, there's no any extra rooms. Um, in Illinois, I had a smaller house, but I had an office there. It was just the way that a lot of the houses are built in the Midwest there. They kind of have a, a room before you enter the house. And I was always, always able to make that my office area and it would work, but I don't have that luxury here despite having a a lot more space in my house. So I've had to use this dining room. Uh, the reason you don't see me today is because my cat, one of my cats ripped down the uh, the curtain and pissed on it. So uh, there'd be a bright window behind me. So I can't really record like that. I know in the past there's been some light seeping out and I, I hate that, but um, that was not something that I wanted to do. But we've, my wife and I have kind of decided that um, this area might be better utilized for something else. We have a breakfast nook, whatever, in our kitchen. So we actually have a table there where we can eat. So this kitchen has been, um, I mean, excuse me, dining room has been empty. So I, I was able to set up in this area. But our inventory for our business is like now seeping into the freaking um, bleeding into the living room. And it's, it's not organized and looks like shit. And we've just decided that this area is better suited for uh, keeping inventory. And then my wife would like a, a pantry as well because we actually don't have one in our kitchen and it drives us crazy. So we like to purchase some kind of pantry that we would put in this area. Long story short, whatever my setup is going to be going forward is not going to look professional enough to have my face on screen. Table, I, I might be at a... I'm not talking about the dining room I'm in now. I'm talking about my other one. I might be there. I might be in the kitchen somewhere. I might be um, in my room. I don't know what my setup is going to be. I don't know that much. So uh, pretty soon here, you're just not going to see my face, period. That's just what's going to be easiest for me um, podcasting. If you want me to keep keep it going, if you want me to keep doing this thing, you gotta gotta roll with the punches with me. Let's get into this episode of Impact. I thought it was solid enough. It wasn't, you know, they didn't knock it out the park for me, but it wasn't a bad episode at the same time. We have to give TNA grace sometimes because they're doing Victory Road that's two weeks apart from emergence. You're either going to have an episode full of predictable matches or you're going to have an, uh, or I should say not an episode, but a show full of predictable matches or a show full of random matches. It's going to be one of the two. There's not, there's not going to be long-term stories and, you know, thing you can't build. It's impossible to build a show that's two weeks after your previous one. It's just not going to happen. So that's why I said we have to give them some grace this victory road is king of the rematch clause. We're just getting matches we have already seen before. Again, you're either going to get that or you're going to get something random like final resolution last year where they just threw matches together and people were like, well, these matches are random. I mean, it's, we're going to complain either way, right? So we have to give them a little bit of grace. So victory road is going to be you know, it's headlined by shit we have already seen before and we don't necessarily want to see again, but we're going to. But that's just how it is. They did a show in San Antonio a couple of years ago. I think this is the one Rich Swan got hurt at. It was like in a brewery and they did very, very good with the attendance. I thought I thought it came off good. So hopefully this one in San Antonio uh, does very well also uh, through Vet Ticks. You know, you can always get free tickets at TNA for veterans. So, and it doesn't get more military than San Antonio, Texas. 
There is there there is not a, a city in the United States that is more military than San Antonio. So, you know, Mike Mike Gilbert was saying that he doesn't believe that they're doing it much promotion and marketing with Steve Macklin in the area, which I think you should do. I think you should take advantage of that. He doesn't have to be a huge television star to do it. I used to when I was living in Illinois. I used to travel to Tennessee for, I don't remember the name of the, the promotion. Uh, the guy, my contact over at NWA, we used to work for TNA. He used to work for that company and he used to invite me to the shows. And um, what was his name, man? Crimson. All right. So Crimson, who formerly of TNA, not a huge star by any stretch of the imagination. He would go to the base, uh, to the, we have like a mall on the base called the Exchange. He would go there sign autographs and and do this and this and really engage with the with the troops and the show would roll around and it absolutely packed like you would i remember going to one where i was like there's i've never even seen close to this many people in a tna show you know what i mean so i it, it's promotion that i think you should do something you should take advantage of you know will they do that as they get closer i don't really know this episode of impact took place somewhere in Kentucky. They did emergence here. They said it was sold out. It was about 400 people. I don't know how many people were here at this particular. It was definitely a couple hundred. It sounded fine to me. I was listening to Mike's show yesterday, and he said that you couldn't hear the crowd. It was dead. It, it is difficult to follow up what they did with Tampa because, I, to me, that was the most professional-looking sounding episode they've or a set of tapings they've ever done since I've covered the company. I was real big on Tampa and I thought the ep episodes were really good too. So this is definitely a step down, but I, to me that I could hear the crowd, they were engaged. I wasn't, you know, I didn't put it on mute. I, I had emergence on mute because I wanted a break from, from Tom and, and Ray wall. But I got, you know, I got a second win, so I was able to listen to this episode, and I didn't think the crowd was dead. I thought they sounded fine, especially the stuff with in the beginning with the system. I thought they were engaged, so I had no, right? I have no uh, problems with this particular episode or this particular set of tapings in Kentucky. Um, it was it was fine to me. The episode itself, it was okay. It was just in the middle. It was just in the middle for me. But again, we have to give them some grace, like I said, because you're when you have uh, a two-week turnaround on a, a TNA Plus show, you're going to have to bump into each other in the hallways, and you're going to have to do that bullshit to put together the matches. That's just the, the nature of the beast. So um, this thing kicks off with um, oh, I kick Tom Hannafin. <laughs> uh what I meant to say, it kicks off with the system. And the system comes out and they do a promo. It's Moose, it's Brian Myers, it's Eddie Edwards, it's uh, in a neck brace, uh, Alicia. Hey, baby. It's uh, JDC. These are spirit fingers. And these are gold. And Masha Slamovich. Meet Fran Stalinaskovich. So it stood out to me that they were. They announced him as the system with JDC and Masha Slamovich. Because even in the past, they would say the system, even if JDC came out with them. So they singled out that they weren't weren't part of the system. I don't enjoy the system. I, I'm a fan of the system for what they are, a fan of the group. I never quite understood how they came together, but um it happened with Final Resolution last year. It was like when they were throwing random matches together, they just threw Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers into a tag team title match, and then they were the system like a week later. So if I'm missing something there, you got you got to let me know. But I feel like they just threw the group together. But it's it's neither here nor there. I like the system, but I don't like these promos. I think Alicia's kind of come into her own a little bit as a heel. Ryan Myers has always been a decent promo. JDC's a great promo. He just says, but he, the only problem is he just says, shut up town. 
Eddie Edwards has a mouthful of marbles, and that doesn't really change. Moose is the one that's taken a big step back for me, and I don't think I've ever said anything negative about Moose on a single show. I love Moose. But I, I don't know if, if they just don't put the effort into their promos because they all have room to speak now. But whether it was in the ring or a backstage or a video package, Moose always, to me, cut really original promos. And ever since he's been part of the system for me, that it doesn't hit. When I was reviewing, man, I don't remember if it was um, after Hard to Kill or Rebellion. I think it was probably after Hard to Kill because I remember being in the audience for this and he's cutting a promo and he he hit us with this Las Vegas Raiders comment that was, I mean, it completely bombed. And I was like, man, that was a, that was a big miss for Moose. And then every promo has been kind of similar like he's he used to be able to say some really scathing shit and it's just not it's not there for me right now um eddie comes eddie's cutting his little promo and he says we we hear what you've been chanting and i'm thinking to myself is he gonna say fuck the system and he said you've been chanting system failure nobody has chanted that not one fan. Not one. If you didn't pick up, they're trying to get over system failure and system reboot. They're trying to get those terms over. They beat them to death this episode, especially system reboot. So maybe we're getting a t-shirt. But uh, they definitely were trying to get those those phrases over. Uh, but nobody has ever chanted system failure in their life. No one's even put those two words together for the most part. Brian Myers comes out and he says, we are exercising our contractually obligated rematch. My eyes roll in the back of my head. And then I was like, okay, we're getting Slammiversary rematches and all that. I just can't, folks, like these contractually obligated rematches, it sometimes, I mean, it's a good crutch. It's a good crutch to fall back on. But unless, unless a champion or, or or a challenger like were blatantly screwed, I don't think there's need for these rematches. That's just the, the way I watch wrestling. Like if you beat someone clean, whether they were the champion or not, like end of the fucking line. Now with the uh, the militia wrestling Spitfire every freaking week, it is not. I've said this before too. There's it's not. Their fault. It's not the malicious fault that the goof referee took 60 minutes to remove, excuse me, six might as well have been 60 minutes, Iron Man match, 60 seconds to remove the knockouts tag titles from the ring so that the militia could cheat. Like that is not their fault. But anyway, Brian Myers is letting us know there's going to be a contractually obligated rematch at us, not at Slammiversary, but at Victory Road. And then Moose talks, and he lets Johnny Dango Curtis know that if they win versus Joe Hendry and Mike Santana tonight, that he's officially part of the system. And if uh, they lose, that they're pretty much going to kick him out of the system, whoop his ass. I wrote in my notes, they won't win. Because I said to myself, there's no fucking way TNA is beating Mike Santana and Joe Hendry again. They just lost that emergence. I was like, there's no way. They do 50-50 booking more than anything. There's re- very rarely like win streaks. You know what I mean? Everyone, you, you get a win one week, you lose the next. It is like that more often than not. I'm not going to say it's all the time, but more often than not. So I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here like, dude, these they're, those guys aren't going to lose again. That's not going to freaking happen. So I'm already mentally preparing myself for JDC. And his spare fingers getting kicked out of the system. Then Alicia talks saying she knows her rights. The neck brace was a nice touch, by the way. She knows her rights and she doesn't have to defend her. You know, what did she say that you have 30 days to defend the title? So this is old school mentality. There's a lot of things about old school wrestling that I think works and some that doesn't. And this is one that doesn't for me. 
I think this got introduced in the 90s that you had to defend your title every 30 days to to keep it. I appreciate that. But TNA is too small of a company for that. If you're a AEW, you're a WWE, a WWF, WCW, you can you can pull that off. To me, TNA is too small of a company, and now you're forcing title matches. But it gives us some context why every single TNA Plus show, the titles are on the line. I'm always sitting here like, don't defend the, every single fucking title all the time. Now we know that TNA views, you have to defend the title every 30 days. And I, I bet if you looked at the numbers, the, the knockouts, tag team titles, and digital media championship and all that have gone 45, 60 days without being defended. If we're if we really look at the numbers, I, I doubt they stick to it. But in general, if that's what they're trying to go with, I understand, but I think the company's too small to do that because what happens is you start using your good title matches for TNA Plus, some of your good builds for TNA Plus, and then the the uh, the pay per view rolls around, and it's kind of like the the title matches feel a little more thrown together. And if you're big, if you have your big four pay per views, and they're supposed to stand out. It's hard to do that when the titles are getting defended every single month. That's just, you know, my my personal opinion. Trying to buy time on this Alicia thing. Uh, she's saying she's already letting us know ahead of time that she can she can pick a replacement if necessary. Knowing them, it's gonna be someone from the roster, it'd probably be Ash by Elegance, if they do that. And as she's cutting this promo, the music hits. No one cares, but it is Spitfire. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just that- a job. No one really cares about this team. I think Danny Luna probably has a few more fans than, than uh, her counterpart. I'm going to give them props that they have done some kind of long term story here as far as. Spitfire going back to basics and wrestling each other and wrestling random matches and wrestling Tasha steals and then eventually trying to get their titles back. I'm going to give the company props for that. It's not like they're just throwing this match together randomly, which is normally how they book the knockouts tag team division. I just don't think anyone really wants to see them win the belts. I don't think anyone wants to see them beat the militia. I know, I know people are not fans of Alicia Edwards like I am, but there's a lot of fans of, Mal- of Masha Slamovich out there. So I don't think people necessarily want this to happen. But Spitfire comes out. You would have thought it was an empty arena. And Alicia has, has told them, we've already beat you twice. And Spitfire's like, but, but you cheated. This isn't... You know, Rick Rude, or excuse me, Bobby Heenan holding down the Ultimate Warrior's ankle while he's being pinned from an angle that the ref could not have possibly seen. You know what I'm saying? Like, this was, again, the goof referee going to the wrong side of the ring and taking a full minute to remove the belts from the ring so that the militia could tie up a belt in the corner on the other side and send Jody Threat into it or whatever and win the match. I mean, the, the feud should be dead, but it's not. Whatever. We're going to get it. I told you, and I have told you, that they're going to wrestle until Spitfire wins the belts. This is why no one gets over in wrestling these days. It's because you can... This is not the the, the best example in the world, but you, you'll build up this feud, and you just know the baby face is going to win. And the heel somehow wins. And instead of using that moment as getting the heel over and getting a momentum, you just know in the back of your mind, well, the baby face is eventually going to come back and win. Like they always get their comeuppance in every feud in modern day wrestling. Like back in the day, the heel would get over because you would you would build up that heel and you would get into their story. Uh, I mean, you would build up the baby face. I'm sorry. And you would get into their story and you you just knew this motherfucker was going to win, and this motherfucker was going to win the belt. 
and the heel gets over and the, the, the heel wins. And now the heat continues and this heel is just continually building up. But now in wrestling, it's like, okay, the heel gets over. They wrestle again. The heel wins again. And instead it's the baby face is going to wrestle until they eventually win the belts. If you watch NWA, the, uh, what, what's it? What's their fucking name? Um, Blunt Force Trauma, tag team titles for ta- or tag team champions for, I feel like for a good couple years. It was Marche Rocket and um, Rodney Mack, but they wear masks, and they're managed by Aaron Stevens. They've been the champions forever. At one point, they beat the team of Trevor Murdoch and Mike Knox, and that was the one they were really building up. Yo, this team's gonna win. They're gonna these baby faces are gonna win the t- championships. The heels won, but because I know wrestling, instead of using that opportunity to, uh, to just continue the momentum of the heels, I just knew they were going to come back one day and the baby faces were going to win this title. And they just won the titles last week. I just knew, I just knew like, okay, they beat two of the top baby faces, which that's sad to say, but those are two of the top baby faces over there. And I just knew that's the team that's eventually going to win. There's no way that the heels are going to beat two of the top baby faces and they're just going to let it be. I don't know if anything I said just now made any kind of sense whatsoever. But the point is, they just, the baby, same with Nick. Okay, I'm going to use Nick Nemeth and Moose for example. Moose beats them. Awesome. In the back of your mind, you're, you're like, they're going to wrestle again until Nick Nemeth wins the title. And that's not exactly what happened, but. You you just knew like instead of oh man Moose Moose beat Nick Nemeth who's next what what babyface's dreams is he gonna crush next it's he wins but he's eventually gonna lose to that person you know we're spending a, entirely too much time on this if the Spitfire loses they will disband as a team no one no one cares they shouldn't be teasing anything about any tag teams disbanding because they don't have tag teams. But they've always kind of teased a little bit loosely that the militia could disband at any moment. And now Spitfire might. We're just we're just blowing up all the tag teams. I did a um, upload a few days ago, and I had mentioned, well, after you know, after we knew that Killer Kelly was pregnant, I said, well, that's why she got pinned. That's why she got rolled up and pinned, and they lost the titles in that one match. And that's why when I met her, she had a three XL zip up hoodie on and then it was um peeling back the curtain for you guys here giving you a little knowledge then it was brought to my attention that killer kelly actually was not pregnant in that match and she wasn't pregnant when i met her either so she just wears big clothes um but she was pulled off tv for something but let the speculation continue because so it all made sense for a second we're like oh well she was pregnant that's why they lost the tag team titles in eight seconds and she Masha did all the wrestling, and then Killer Kelly just got rolled up. That made sense to us, right? She was pregnant. <laughs> she was not. So back to the back to the conspiracy theories on what's uh what's going on with Killer Kelly. And it's not that she's filming some C movie that most likely took like a week or two to, to shoot. I mean, she's not still shooting. This is not, you know, coming to the theaters in 2025 like she's this isn't some some six seven month shoot eric young's backstage after this randomly letting us know excuse me that based off one match he has steve macklin's back for life he has a match with jake something later in the evening and gia has said that they had a history and i'm like what fucking history do they have nice on Tom Hannafin to let us know that they it dated back to violent by design because I would have not picked up on it at all. So good on him for that. I give Tom Hannafin a very hard time, but just to be clear, I've never had it much of an issue with the content of what he says. It's just how he says it. Fake voice, fake reactions. That's more what I'm talking about. Because of the content of what he does, he's one of the smarter play-by-play guys they they have. That he knows he has a very good knack of 
when he has to give us um what's the word I'm looking for? Context. He has to give us con- he knows when to give you context. When you there might be a storyline that just needs that little bit more from the commentator uh the commentary because we forgot what they've done in the past or what the story was. He does a pretty good job of filling in the blanks. I told this story two or three weeks ago. It was one of my podcasts that I dropped like really late in the week. So those don't usually do very well. But the story I told was that I was watching. I had a little bit of time. I pulled up this WWE match on YouTube that I had interest in watching from the pandemic era. And, uh, Pandemic or close to it was it was in that era, but I'm listening. I'm like this comment, this play by play guy is very good. You know, like I would love to have someone like him in TNA. Who is it? I look it up. It's Tom Hannafin speaking in his normal voice, not the fake radio voice. He wasn't even oh, what a kick out! Like he was just in his normal voice doing commentary. He was like a different person. I thought he sounded really, really good. And you can say what you want about WWE. I know the wrestlers that depart there say I was overproduced. I think WWE does a good job of of producing people. That's what they do. Wrestlers just think that they know better a lot of the time. They told me how to act and how to talk and how to do this and this, but then you see them go to WWE or excuse me, go to AEW and do whatever they want. Sound like fucking idiots. So I think WWE producing people and keeping them from uh, giving into their own worst habits, because this was like another person. Let's move on. I know I talk commentary every freaking episode, but let's move on. We had a, an X division showcase match. I said this last week. I'm going to say it again. This no weight limits, it's no limits. You know you know what other championship in TNA is not about weight limits, it's about no limits. The TNA World Title. So what's the difference between the two? Is it the style of wrestling? Because Hammerstone doesn't wrestle that style. It's it's a fucking cruiserweight championship and call it that. Because if you don't, then there's no difference between the world title and the exhibition championship. They're both no limits. Not about weight limits, it's about no limits. If this match were Hammerstone versus Jake something, would you call it an X Division showcase? So that's my issue. X Division should be a style of wrestling. Should have a weight class. Most wrestlers are small these days, so it's not like it's difficult to fit to fill the division. This isn't the lightweight division in WWF where everyone was huge and they just had to find a bunch of random small wrestlers that no one cared about. Everyone's small now, so it's easy to have a damn X Division and just call it a cruiserweight division. So it's Kushida versus Laredo. King. Make, make a make a uh, a good good lucha lucha thing. If you don't like my sound bites, you don't have to listen to the podcast. I'm gonna put it bluntly to you. So this was a very random match that was thrown together. Two baby faces. They were going at it for a little bit. Josh comes down and causes a no contest. And they always do that for the matches that mean nothing. Uh, you. I should have known when this was thrown on the card to begin with that when I see Kushida versus the number one contender for the digital media championship, Laredo kid. And I know that the match means nothing. I should have known something was going to happen. Josh Alexander comes down. He attacks um, Laredo kid attacks Kushida and then Kushida challenges Josh Alexander so that, there is your first uh, impromptu match of the night. And Josh Alexander wins. And uh, after the match, 
Kushida is selling backstage like he um, got hit with a jackhammer. And I, like all, he just got hit with a C4 spike. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but he, he is selling it like his neck is broken. Joe Hendry just so happens to walk up. That's what, you know, when I was saying last week that Joe Hendry, rather than it seem like they have something for him, they're just like, throwing him out there they're just he's just everything feels very very random it's like we have to have him on the show because he's blowing up but we don't have anything for him so we're just going to kind of throw him out there and then uh he comes face to face with josh alexander and now he cares now he said don't don't think i i didn't forget like now this motherfucker cares about josh alexander the heat a lot of the heat is gone you can probably regenerate some of it but you need to strike while the iron's hot. There's very few feuds in wrestling that have any real heat to them. They really could have had something here that would have also elevated Josh a little bit more because they're trying to elevate Josh as their guy, as one of their guys. And in the TNA bubble, he is. But outside of the bubble, he's still not. He's still not there. Like NXT has not. Hey, let's get Josh Alexander on screen. You understand what I'm saying? So. Um, to me, it was in their best interest to to uh, strike while the iron was hot and and do this feud immediately. Instead, they waited waited like a month, and now now these two guys care about each other. Jordan Grace then has an open challenge after this, which is getting a little bit boring to me, but I think it's gonna go somewhere, so I can live with it. So Jordan Grace, um, she comes out and we get the music of Ariana Grace, who I like a lot. She is the daughter of Santino Morello. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. So I knew it was only a matter of time to s- until she ended up on the show. And she said she's not wrestling, but she's going to be the liaison between TNA and NXT. Now her gimmick, her she's mixed NXT, Miss NXT. It's very over the top. It's very cringe, but that is that is the gimmick. Um, I I followed her a little bit before NXT happened because she was doing some NWA work. Uh, met her once in per- person, made a lasting impression on me. So I've uh, I've always been a fan. So the fact that she comes out, she's like, I'm going to be the liaison. That kind of tells us, you know, we're going to continue this. NXT TNA thing within the women's division. And uh, that might be what ultimately happens to Bound for Glory. It might, it might, you know, we've been wondering what are they going to do with Jordan? It very thing with NXT. Because we're assuming jo- Jordan Grace is going to go there. So it would be a very seamless transition if she were to win the knockouts, I mean, she to lose the knockouts championship to someone on NXT and then uh, eventually join the NXT roster and try to get the title back. Like there's some interesting things they could do with that, but I don't know who that NXT girl would ultimately be. I don't know. Cause they're, they're, you know, they don't have the biggest roster in the world either. Roxanne Perez is the biggest possible name you've got over there. You know, so we've already used her. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know quite what they're going to do here, but she says she is not wrestling. Um, instead, it's going to be Carmen Petrovich. Uh, Matthew Raywall calls Carmen Petrovich a rising star in TNA. So I enjoy this match. I, I disagree with Mike. He wasn't impressed with Carmen Petrovich. I thought uh, her offense was very unique. It's I like wrestlers that show us different something different than what others show us. When you're like, okay, well, here's so and so, and they come out, they're doing cutters and shit like that. I'm like, well, everyone does the cutter. She had a she had a, a level of offense that we haven't really seen before. It was just something very very different. She's also hotter than a three dollar pistol. That goes without being said. Uh, but I enjoy the match. 
it was just you know contrasting styles that also worked. I don't think Hannafin should be calling Grace or joining Grace Grace when there's Ariana Grace involved in this angle as well. That's why you don't just single people out by their last names when they're common names. But I enjoyed the match. I thought it was I thought it was fine. Um again, I kind of disagree with Mike on that. He, I know he's um he has a better eye for what a, a good match is than I do, but I mean, that's the best way I can put it. When someone comes out and they've got a different look than everybody else, they've got a different uh, style of wrestling, just different offense, I get into it. That just that just stands out to me. Rosemary's watching this match. And uh, thank God Tom Hannafin knew who she was this time. Because at Slammiversary, she was watching a knockouts title match. And Tom Hannafin goes, is that Rosemary? No fucking Tom. It's the other girl with face paint in this company. So at least he knew who she was this time. But Jordan wins the match. Again, I'm I'm impressed with um, Carmen Petrovich. The lights go out. We get hit with the Tom Hannafin. What the hell? And then the lights turn out and there's a pillow next to her. No one knew what the fuck was going on. It, it's I know that like Wendy Chu, who's who's uh, linked up with Rosemary right now in NXT. She used to have this gimmick where she used to wrestle in her pajamas, and it, it was really weird, man. Um, she would, like, sleep during the match. It, it was, But now she's more of a, a Rosemary-style character, but there's still, there's still um, hints of that old character. So that's where they're going with this Wendy Chu versus... Uh, Jordan Grace. And maybe that's the one. Maybe that's the one that culminates at uh, Bound for Glory. And, and maybe she beats Jordan. You know, with, I mean, Lord knows there's no one on the knockouts roster that could beat Jordan as, as a current knockout. There, There is nobody. So maybe she does drop it at NXT and then becomes an NXT star and, and continues to wrestle for the title. It would be the most seamless transition in the history of professional wrestling if they were to do something like that. ABC has a little promo after this, which was fine. Um, there was all these effects and all sorts of stuff. And then it gets interrupted by First Class. I'm looking forward to seeing First Class as a trio and seeing how um, how they how they're presented. Or maybe we never see Rich Swan again, and this is it going forward. I think Casey Navarro did a good job in his role, but he was also like acting really weird and just kind of saying random things and didn't, he sounded like he was going <coughs> to, excuse me, sounded like he was going to speak, but he didn't. It was kind of like a weird, weird promo for me. Even though ABC has beaten first class before we are going to get this match again, we're just, we're just getting these rematches. Then we get a knockouts video package of Zia Lee. I think she um that's not her her indie name. I think it's Zia Zhao. I don't know what the exact pronunciation is. And I hate to try to pronounce names when I don't know. So we're gonna have to uh, to wait and see. But everyone seems very excited about her. I don't know uh jack shit about her. None. Uh I had this video package sent to me in my inbox by tna and i just responded i don't know who that is <laughs> they said well everyone else does don't worry I'm like okay cool then we get zachary wentz in the ring they said we're gonna hear from zachary wentz the only issue i have with zach wentz winning the x division championship is that he, it's just kind of being done to get it on nxt because if he wasn't doing stuff with nxt and and his old partner, like he wouldn't have, TNA would not put the exhibition championship on him, you know? It's like, um, we want to see our guys win titles and get, get pushed. But if there was no agreement here, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have won this title at any time, you know? So, uh, kind of indifferent on it, but I thought he came out briefly, he cut a brief promo and I thought he sounded pretty good. 
And he was able to, you know, communicate to us that he's been through a lot. He went through a lot with his his uh, previous marriage where I think a lot of people didn't know if he was going to be able to wrestle again, like if he was going to get blackballed or whatever, because he gets, you know, he got fired from NXT. And um, I, I think I think Wentz has a good name in the wrestling world. I think they know he's a good guy. He seemed to have been, you know, outside looking in, like he was in a pretty toxic situation. And he looks like he's in a really healthy one right now with, uh, God, what what is her name that he's uh, dating right now? Uh, G- Gigi Dolan. That's who it is, Gigi Dolan. What a what a step up for him. And I, I don't mean physically because a beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But I'm saying what a step up as far as it seems like he's in a very healthy relationship now where if you follow you know, his ex on Twitter, which I was a fan of what she did in TNA. I think she's really good in the ring and I, I liked her music, her entrance, her presentation. Um, you know, I, I think she did a very good job, but like if you follow her Twitter, she's four quarters short of a dollar. And um, we never know, you never know the context, the full context of a toxic relationship or bad relationship. You always kind of know one side and and it just seems like he's in a very good place in life. But she, you know, she definitely got him fired <laughs> from NXT. But he seems like he's in a good place. So he has a he has a little bit of a redemption story, a little bit of a baby face story that we can get behind. So that his promo sounded very good here. And then um cheese ball Mike Bailey's music plays. Cheese. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in a dumpster one time? I got out. And I was like, man, are you serious? Like I was looking forward to continuing to hear um Zach Wentz go because I thought he was I thought the promo was doing very In one good. word. Would I use dope? Nope. I mean I, I was I was into it. I wanted him to keep going. Thank God Mike Bailey just came out and just basically said congratulations. I'm enacting my rematch clause and we're gonna wrestle. We're gonna have a wrestling match. So it's fine. It was, um, you know, kind of a kind of a handshake thing, and then the good hands come out, and they do their stick, and that leads leads to another impromptu match. I had to laugh because uh, the minute that the good hands attacked, I think they attacked Mike Bailey. I can't remember exactly who. The minute they attacked him, the female ref comes running down. I mean, the the the, the split second there was any kind of physicality, the ref comes down. And Tom Hannafin says, Santino is making this match official. Santino acts very fucking fast, doesn't he? San- Santino is, he he's on it today. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. So now it's official. We're getting the good hands versus um, Mike Bailey and Zach Wentz. The match obviously didn't last very long. And Mike Bailey and Zach Wentz win. They coexist so that they can uh, move on to wrestle each other. But... Yeah, I, I thought that Mike Bailey coming and just keeping it very, very brief on his end was a good thing because I really did not want to hear him talk. Like his promos are fucking painful. Steph Delander, um, let's she her and PCO are in a closet or something like that. And um Tom Hannafin lets us know I've been told Steph Delander requested time inside the impact zone. Next. So uh Steph Delander is coming out and she's every week dressed like some kind of bride of Frankenstein. And then we get a Rosemary video package, which looked really, really cool. It was really well done. Very well shot. The lighting, the angles, very good. I don't know what the fuck she was talking about. And I never do in these promos. I'm like completely fucking lost. So I think she's a heel now because she's aligned with Wendy Chu and Rosemary heel Rosemary is awesome. It's just that people love Rosemary. So it's hard to cheer against her. So after that, um, 
Then we get the segment uh, with Steph Double DeLander in the ring. Everybody's been real nice. Well, that's because you have big jugs. And Matt Card, she calls out Matt Cardona. And um, again, this storyline is, is, I was open to it. I'm not, I, I don't really know what I think about it at this point. But Matt Cardona comes out. And he's he's been calling Steph Delander his property, right? Um, I guess he has a contract, and he's he's. I'm trying to make sense of this because I'm like, surely Steph Delander didn't sign her life away to this dude, but I'm trying to make sense of it. He has a contract saying that I brought you to the states, and I did this and this. Um, you're, I'm the reason you're here in TNA. I'm the reason. You know, like no one cared about you prior to this and 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 all that. So they needed an out to make this divorce happen because the wedding actually went through. They needed an out. And this contract is probably the out to get them annulled or divorced or whatever you want to call it. And they're... I didn't catch this. Mike pulled it out that, or Mike pointed it out that he had said, I can make you bark like a dog. I didn't pick up on that. Uh, that is a throwback to Vince McMahon. And that's not something you want to associate yourself with, especially a comment like that. Like it worked at the time, but it doesn't work now. And um, then PCO comes out. Like this is obviously leading towards them eventually having a match it's probably gonna be a monster's ball and i think they want to put the titles on cardona we don't know when matt cardona is going to be uh cleared what i think and again i'm usually wrong what i think is that they're going to have some kind of monster's ball match and all of the monsters you know um Uh, Mad Men Fulton, like they're going to get involved. And then all Matt Cardona is going to have to do is pin him. Like, I mean, that makes sense, right? That that could possibly happen. If we're just talking about the, the within the confines of the story and what they're doing so far and knowing that Matt can't really wrestle and that most likely they want Matt to hold those titles. I think that makes sense. So we'll see if that's what they do. Again, I'm usually wrong with my predictions, but to me, that makes a lot of sense to to do something like that. We got a really good Hardy's promo after this. I thought it was a real nice touch with Matt saying, you know, people always tell us you were this and you were that. Like, no, we are. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I'm sure they do deal with that a lot in these autograph sessions. Oh man, I watched you as a kid. You guys were my favorites. And they're trying to say, yo, we can still go. I would really like to see the Hardys um, signed long term. But the problem is, if there's even an inkling that someone can get to AEW or get to WWE, TNA is a booking to them. We saw Mustafa Ali end up on AEW last night. It's it's just a booking. If the opportunity is there to go there and make that money, they're not signing with TNA. That's the reality of it. When they were with TNA before, I think that they felt like their WWE time was over. And then they discovered the broken gimmick. And then they started saying, well, hey, we would, we'd like one more run in WWE. They get that one more run in WWE. And then they go to AEW. And now they're old. And they are still cutting interviews saying one more run in WWE. They're always looking for the, a lot of these wrestlers are always looking for that one more run. And until they convince themselves that that last run isn't there or that run in a bigger company isn't there, they're not going to sign with TNA. That's just, that's really the nature of it when you've got guys with names like this. So, but I would like to see them stick around for a while because the, they do their best work in TNA. TNA knows how to produce them in the ring, put them in matches that don't make them look old. 
everything they've done so far has been very, very good, very entertaining. They don't have to work a lot of dates. They're going to wrestle the system here pretty soon. And the tag team title scene is a little jumbled right now. But knowing TNA, I, I really think Bound for Glory, we're going to see some kind of four-way with the Hardys, the system, um, first class, and ABC. I think we're going to see some kind of fucking fuck fest uh, with all these guys. But I think the Hardys are going to win the title. The Hardys are not coming to TNA to not win the belts. There is a formula that TNA follows. And if you have certain cachet in WWE, you're going to win a championship. Now, we're not really seeing that with Ash by Elegance because Ash by Elegance didn't even win championships in WWE when she was there. She just won the 24-7 champion championship. She was never, she was always a jobber from the beginning over there. Like she's here, she's reinventing herself, but the name Dana Brooke doesn't actually have a lot of cachet in wrestling. So where the Mustafa Ali's and the Nick Nemeth and the Hardys, they do. So they're going to put titles on them. That just, it's just going to happen. So the Hardys aren't going in anywhere until they win the championships. They're not doing some kind of tour with TNA where they just come and have some matches and leave. That's not, not going to happen. These motherfuckers are going to win the, the titles at some point. After this, we have Eric Young. Like those like those times where like the rah rah speeches and like getting everybody up, because like nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. But. Versus Naked Jake. Do you mind if I slip into something more comfortable? So they had a match here. The match was fine. Um, Tom Hannafin. He was talking about Eric Young hitting someone with a pile driver in the beginning. I don't remember who he was talking about. I think he was talking about Macklin, but he's just like, hit him with a pile driver. I'm like, why do you talk like this? Just talk normal. There was one of the uh, between matches where, you know, every episode they'll have one quick segment where it shows Matt and, and Tom sitting in their seats talking. And Tom was speaking in his normal voice, which he normally doesn't at any point. But he was talking in his normal voice. It stood out to me. And I'm like, dude, just always talk like this. What is what is all this bound for glory? So um, they had a good match. Jake something finally turns. And I don't think anybody cared because they waited too long. They wouldn't have cared if he turned on Diener because they don't care, care about Diener. But they just waited too long to do it. I've pointed it out many, many times. They had an organic opportunity with Joe Hendry because the crowd turned on him in the match, even though they tried to do a babyface versus babyface. They had a very good organic opportunity to turn him. But because that wasn't what they had planned creatively, they tried to push him as a babyface a little bit more. And now the turn happened in a random match. Because I know Telegraph and Tom tried to tie in Violent by Design to this. But that was a long time ago. There's By having Jake turn here, it's like, why? There's no like real reason for it. Like He has no real reason to just turn on uh, Eric Young. I mean, if they're trying to tie in the Violent by Design thing, okay. I think it's a stretch. Because no one, again, if if Telegraph and Tom didn't say that earlier, I would not have known that they had wrestled before or had any kind of feud. Because Jake doesn't really feud with anybody. But the, the turn has finally happened. Uh, we, we finally have the Jake something heel turn. I, I think it was way too late, but it did, have, it did happen. And then Steve Macklin ran down. Well, then- Then after this, Joe Hendry just aimlessly walking around backstage. I mean, is this what wrestlers do between matches? Just storm around backstage. And he just aimlessly walking around. Gia Miller happens to be on the other side of the door. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. And um, they say some shit. I kind of blocked it out, if I'm being honest with you. Then they interviewed Heather Reckless out after this. She's the the latest knockout. She is very good. 
the first thing everyone points out about her is her height that she is four nine i've never met someone that short in my life um i dated a girl in my my late 20s that was 5 11 well she's still 5 11 i act like she's passed away um because i still know her but she's she's 5 11 and to me she was like did i say 5 11 4 11 i'm sorry um i dated someone that's 4 11 um and to me it was just like insanely short you know i, I can't even imagine a, a, an adult <laughs> being 4 9 that is absolutely crazy listening to mike's show someone was saying oh well she's not the She's not smaller than Alicia. I think someone said something like that. Alicia is like 5'3 or 5'4. Like, we just think she's short. I mean, she is short, but we just think she's tiny because she's p- petite. Like, she's taller than Jordan Grace is. Jordan Grace is about like 5'3, I believe. She is, and, and then Ash is not that much taller. She's like 5'. She's in that range too. Alicia is taller than them. Um, but Ash came out in heels and the personal concierge was there. And then um, uh, Giselle Shaw comes out, who I would imagine is in a five, seven, five, eight range. I, I could be wrong, but I, I know she's taller. They dwarfed Heather Reckless. But when I had a vision, though, when they were all standing around her and they were completely dwarfing her, is that as much as everyone's like, well, they, I see her being this little spitfire type of baby face. I, I actually envision her being the little lackey for um, Ash by Elegance. I just saw it on screen. Like if you were to just, just go back to that screen and just pause it, you can see it. And they have to freshen Ash's character up. You know, because she... They were they were building her up to challenge for the championship, and she'd done that a couple times, and she's lost. And now it's like, okay, you can't just go back to what you're doing. We need to switch things up a little bit. And I think adding adding a little lackey helps. So I don't know what happens in this match because um, Heather Reckless is going to wrestle Giselle Shaw next week, which I can't even – the height difference is insane for that match. But because they kind of teased – Uh, Because Giselle slapped Ash by Elegance. They kind of teased some dissension there, even though we know they're not going to actually wrestle and have a match, which would have been a good feud, by the way. But we know that that's not going to happen now. I think that Ash by Elegance probably cost Giselle the match. And I'm, I'm totally speculating here. I'm just going off what we saw on screen. I can see her costing her the match and then Heather Reckless kind of teaming teaming up with her. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But um, no, no, Heather Heather Reckless is very good. So um, I was glad that they brought her on. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Then we get the system main event, which was JDC and Moose versus Mike Santana and Joe Hendry. And I'm thinking there's no way that Moose and JDC are going to win here. They're going to beat up JDC. And I was pissed even just thinking about that because I want him to be in the system. So I I actually fast forwarded to the end of this match, not because I didn't want to watch it or I didn't have interest in it because they can all work. And that fits what I I want to see in a match. I knew it wasn't going to go super, super long. I know about my intelligence. These guys can work. So I was, I, I had interest in the match, but I was too interested in if JDC was going to get kicked out or not. So I fast forwarded to the end and um, I know Alicia caused the distraction. Moose hits the spear on Mike Santana and they win. I couldn't believe it. So JDC now is um, part of the system, which uh, I'm looking forward to that being official, like a ref with a whistle. And they're doing a real good job of right now. Santana cannot get one over on Moose. Like that is, they're not 50 50 booking this at all. Like he's just Moose keeps getting this guy's number. And um, if Moose ends up beating Nick Nemeth at Victory Road, there's a path for Santana to get his comeuppance and get the title off him at Bound for Glory or at another time. I don't know that Joe Hendry, 
I know people want him to be the champion. I can tell you that TNA does not feel like Joe Hendry needs the belt. I know that like he's over and they don't feel he needs the belt. I'll tell you guys that right now. And in my heart of hearts, I think they're going to continue to have that mindset. That is going to do it for me, folks. I am your boy, BQ. We're here at exactly an hour. I will talk to you next week. I'm out. Peace.